So welcome, Jim Mallison, uh, back again, once again, to Keen on Yoga. It's really great to have you. Um, Jim has been a integral part of the Happy Yoga Project, which uh, ran for a few years. I think it's still wrapping up now. And uh, as well as a very interesting character altogether, having lived for a number of years with the, uh, a certain group of sadhus in India and, uh, and even being initiated. I think you, you're, a, you're an initiate to a particular sect of a nath. Nath Babas, aren't you, or something like that? No, no, that's a completely different gang. Anyway, hi, Adam. Good, nice. Thanks for asking. That. <laughs> I obviously didn't um, blow it too much last time talking about Vajroli all the time. But now I'm Ramanandis. The Ramanandi Tyagis is my my sect. So it's a different group from the Nats. But yeah, yeah, nice to be back. Anyway, yeah, it's great to see you again. And um, last time we talked about Vajroli Mudra a lot. We know Vajroli Mudra is a Particular kind of, we're not going to talk about that all the time this time. Particular mudra where you, you suck liquids um, up your penis, basically. Um, so you're conserving vital, the vital uh, energy of your uh, organism, and uh, and that's uh, then sub sublimated into a, a spiritual energy. So uh, we're probably going to try and not to talk for an hour again on Bajroli mudra and uh, all different and how to do it and and, and all different. I, I remember milk your. You know, your, uh, your you're saying you're not going to talk about it, Adam, but you're I know, already... I know. I know. <laughs> well, I just had that memory in my mind of the of your guru being able to suck up milk, and then and then he was pissing milk, and 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 everyone around him thought it was a kind of magic power. Um, it's stuck in my mind ever since. Anyway, on serious subjects, and this is rather more serious. Um, let's uh, start off by just asking what what you're currently working on. Well, I've got two newish research projects going on. And I'm still finishing off various things from the Hapta Yoga project, which I formally mm. finished last year. Um, so for that, I'm focusing at the moment on the text called the Data Treya Yoga Shastra, which I published a kind of draft translation of quite a long time ago, but have since uh, edited it from a load of new manuscripts. And of course, I've done this. I, I should, I, I should know this is always going to happen. But as I've been trying to wrap it up and writing up the introduction and so forth and checking out all the manuscripts and the catalogues and where they're listed and so forth. I basically come across about three or four uh, manuscripts of the text catalogued under a different name. So now I have to collect them. Well, I haven't actually finished now, but that's, you know, that's, that's taken up about the last six months whilst I've been working away on that. Uh, interestingly, it's revealed uh, a kind of slightly longer recension, a longer version of the text, which I think is the earliest one. And it has a, an extra 30 or 40 verses on Bajroli, but we don't need to go there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was tempting me back into the fray, really, are you, with that Bajroli stuff? But what is that? I mean, gonna, just for the audience, could you say the, I mean, the import of uh, the, 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 the Dastreya Yoga Shastra, why, why it's uh, such an important text? Yeah, it's a really worth interesting studying. text. I used to think, before we started the Hatha Yoga Project, I used to think it was the first text that kind of said, this is Hatha Yoga, this is what Hatha Yoga is, and then other right. texts built on that. And that we now think, so Jason Birch has been editing a shorter text called the Amaralga, and that's likely to be yeah. earlier, and that's the first text. It gives these four different types of yoga of um, mantra, laya, hatha, and raja, and it says that Hatha Yoga is the three practices first taught in the Amrita Siddhi, so these Mahamudra, Mahabandha, Mahabeda. And then I think mm. that Tatra Yoga Shastra draws on that, but then it expands it and it, it gives these nine practices, nine different mudras. Well, they're later classified as mudras, which it says are, are Hatha Yoga. So it's interesting in that mm. respect. Also, it's the first text to um, combine Patanjali, you know, Ashtanga uh, Yoga with Hatha Yoga, with these kind of more physical methods. So that's a sort of breakthrough. It's interesting. It's trying to make, I've been trying to make sense of how it does this. And it's actually slightly ambiguous in that it gives the eight angas of Patanjali. It doesn't actually mention Patanjali. It attributes these practices to Yagya Valkya, but it's that classical system of eight angas. Mm. Then it gives, mm -hmm. it teaches mm. the nine mudras of Hatha Yoga. And at one place it suggests that they're alternative practices. In fact, it says quite clearly, the, the methods are different, but the results are the same. But then the structure of the text, it, it takes you through, through four stages as you advance through your yoga practice. And the way it does that, it, it, 
implies that you have to do the eight angas, the eight Patanjali angas, and then the mudras of Hatha Yoga. So there's some ambiguity there. And I think that's, I don't think that's a resolvable problem. I think that's just how the text is written. Um, maybe, you know, it's a, something unclear put, put forward by the right, author. Right, so, so it's actually a kind of um, a subsequent practice after you've completed potentially yoga, then the, the Hatha Yoga stands above that rather than Raj yeah, Yoga. That's being, usually Raj Yoga is the completion, isn't it? The ultimate. But this is kind of turns yeah, on its head. Yeah, but they're, they're then all, that, that whole, the whole section on Hatha Yoga, which takes up the vast majority of the text, mm, mm. two thirds of it, is then followed by a short bit on Raja Yoga. So I guess the implication is that if you su succeed at Hatha Yoga, then you, then you attain Raja Yoga. Mm. But yeah, it's just not clear... Yeah, it's, there seem to be two approaches as to whether they, they're alternatives, the, the, the eight angas and the nine mudras of Hatha Yoga, or whether the, 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 the nine mudras follow on from the eight angas. I'm not sure we'll ever work it out. But it's interesting, because that, but that is a kind of crucial point, I think, is in the... Do you think the ambiguity is on purpose as well? Yeah. Huh? What well, the ambiguity? The amb yeah, ambigu it's like there's so many texts that are kind of ambiguous. It's like, well, are you saying that you know, like even even like you know, even Pat Patanjali is saying, you know, at one point he's kind of seeming to be saying one thing, and the other point he's saying, well, you know, this is better, and and another point this is better, or the Gita as well, right? Like you never get a clear you want kind of clear answer, like just tell me what to do. Like you, know, you do the yoga, and then you know the physical yoga, and then you go to the Raja, or you know. Yeah, but often that that is because a text is maybe layered and different bits were are put in at different times. Whereas I'm pretty confident that this text was compiled all in one go. I mean, it's, he never, the, the author of the text never borrows directly from any earlier text. He's making it all up. You know, he's writing his own verses. Right. He's a really good, he's a pretty good Sanskritist. So there seems to be a good coherent, you know, train of thought behind the whole text. So this is the one bit that's, that's confusing me, but I think as a, yeah, it's an important, a point in the history of physical yoga in that it's the first time it's kind of brought into the classical orthodox mainstream by tying it in with mm -hmm. the kind of the Vedic traditions. It's yeah, kind of right. a really important mm. step on it becoming kind of central to mm. uh, Hindu practice as broadly understood. Yeah. Can you tell, I mean, one thing, how can you tell that it was the work of one person that there weren't previous texts that were standing on? And then I suppose, and secondly, can you tell what, what, whether the, what he's talking about here is a sub substantiated practice going back a period of time by the way that it's talked about, you know, and you can you tell anything else about the roots of it going back past that from this first mm -hmm. mention? Okay, so the first part of the question, the reason I'm confident, well, we, you know, we know mm -hmm. a few earlier texts and none of them have any of the verses that we find in this Dutta Treya text. And also the kind of the way it's written, it, it's a coherent style the whole way through. As I say, it's a reasonably high level, high register of Sanskrit compared to some, some yoga texts. So obviously it's only really a hunch and it's not impossible that we might find some older text that is, is drawn on directly. But I, also I, I think we can infer that, he's, that he knows texts like the Amaralga uh, not the Amrita Siddhi directly, I don't think, but also there's another text called the Vivekamaratanda, a nice, good early uh, yoga text attributed to Gauraksha. And I think he knows these texts and he's drawing on them and he's synthesizing them because he's taking their practices, but then he rewrites them right. himself. And so I keep saying uh -huh. he, but, you know, we can be 99.9% .9 sure that it was a, a male author. As for whether the practices are older well we know from some of them because so for example this maha mudra maha veda maha Bandha, that's taught in the mm. art history, which is clearly at least a few centuries older uh, i don't think they're hugely old though i think this is you know this is one of the surprising discoveries or theories i would now strongly argue having been working on the hatha yoga project that i didn't see coming is mm -hmm. that i think all these physical practices are innovations. They only appear on the Indian scene for the first time about a thousand years ago. I used to think hmm. they were, you know, they would have been, yeah, they were being practiced but not written down in text. And then for some reason they suddenly get written down in text. But now I think the weight of evidence is that um, no, they are, they are, they are innovations. It's like a yes. Yeah, so why would that? Yeah, I suppose let's back up a second and say, well, what 
what are these practices we're talking about? That would be my first question. And secondly, there must be a good reason why they came on the scene at that point. Is it, you know, to do with the, the I mean, it's usually said that it's a Buddhist um, interest that, 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 that comes over and informs and brings these kind of more tantric-esque practices on the scene. Is it kind of an immigration or a kind of a, a passageway of influence that may have made this particular time in the medieval period suddenly rather different, you know, in terms of the way they approach yoga? Um, so I suppose it's yeah, two questions. I mean, firstly, let's just get clear for the, for the audience what, what we're talking about when we say Mahabeda, Mahabanda, Mahamudra um, as, the, as the seminal practice in this text. And secondly, what, why then? That it's changed so much because I, I believe on our first uh, chat we talked about the roots of yoga and we talked about the roots of yoga really but being penance really that you know I think you I think you were I don't want to put words in your mouth but I think I think you agreed with me that as much as early on it was an ascetic practice which was generally as uh, you know performed in a kind of for the wish to deny the body for a transcendental aim um, and lastly slightly more breath orientated and then suddenly we find this this rather physical tantric esque kind of uh, different sea change, as it were. Well, the first question's easy to answer. The bit about <laughs> what the practices are. The second question of why and why did it have, why do they appear then is more difficult, and perhaps my answer might be a bit more controversial. But so, the, so the, the first question: What are the practices? Well, we these these practices that get categorised as hutta. First of all, in the Amarauga and then the Dattatriya Yoga Shastra. At that stage, they're, they're just techniques which later get the kind of general name of mudra, which means a seal, but they are physical methods of manipulating the vital energies in the body. And now I say vital energies as a kind of general term again, because the the texts talk about different things where they're always the breath, actually. They always, they always have some effect on the breath in the body, but then also it can be Kundalini, uh, the, the serpent goddess at the, at the, usually at the base of the central channel, she might be made to rise up the central channel, or it can be Bindu uh, in men, which is the, you know, the male generative principle, or Rajas in women, the, the female equivalent. Uh, and then sometimes it talks about the Jiva, which is the kind of, again, that that's a, that just means that the living principle within the body. So there are these various, physical methods of manipulating those. Um, Mahamudra, you know, well, Mahamudra when it's first taught is one of these three practices, Mahamudra, Mahabandha, Mahaveda. And generally they are, they are used, that those three and other practices are employed in order to make these vital principles go up the central channel of the body. Um, Kind of the crudest perhaps or the, the sort of easiest to understand perhaps is the headstand viparita karani or not necessarily a headstand it may have been a shoulder stand it's never, never made that clear in effect um the the viveka maratanda is one of the first texts to teach it and probably is a shoulder stand in there about almost certainly is but yeah then you're using gravity you know it's kind of, if you turn yourself so the the idea is that you've got these these um particularly with you were talking about going up like stuff yes. going up, right, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you turn yourself upside down, right, and it's yeah. going to the head, which is what you want it to do, because gravity. Okay, I see, I see. I, right, okay, yeah, yeah. I I could differentiate it kind of two ways. One is like talking about the kind of you know the Kundalini serpent power rising up the spine, and the other thing which you often you know I, I think it, if I'm correct, uh, uh, see detailed is the idea of trying to stop stuff going kind of dripping down from the head. And, and getting kind of burnt up by the fire, in which case, you know, this, this idea that, you know, if your vital forces don't drip down and get burnt up, then you'll live forever, basically. Yeah. Or, you know, you preserve, yeah, yeah. 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 Which, said, you know, that's said quite explicitly in the, in this, in the Data Treya Yoga Shastra. Um, I think it is about the headstand. You know, if you do it for three hours a day, then you, you won't get old and you won't die because you're, you're stopping this process of the vital energies kind of gradually dripping out. Uh, yeah, either getting burnt up by the fire in the stomach or getting uh, expelled, whether it's ejaculated or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's that that notion. They're, all these things, you know, they're slightly different paradigms, but they kind of combine in this one mm -hmm. idea of preservation and sublimation of raising these things up up the centre of the body. So those are the those are the, the the practices designated as mudras, which in the first early 
uh, definitions of Hatha Yoga, that's what it's said to constitute. But then by the time, by about uh, 1400 or so, when this text called the Hatha Pradipika is put together, which is that, unlike the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, is very much a compilation. So Swat Narama, who's the compiler, the author, I mean, there's plenty of verses that he's written himself as a kind of frame, but then he's just pulling in verses from other texts. So he takes verses from the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, from the Amarauga, from Shiva Sangita, Vedic mm. Martanda, all these different things, and he he puts them together in this synthesis. And the, so the name of the text, Hatha Pradipika, Light on Hatha, mm. and so he's the first person to say that not only are these mudras part of Hatha Yoga, but also you get the asanas, so complex seated positions and uh, complex breathing methods, these kumbhakas as well. Mm. So it's but then around fourteen hundred in the Hatha Pradipika that uh, we get this kind of, not, not the final synthesis, but the most influential mm. uh, designation of what Hatha Yoga is with all these new physical practices. So I assume in the Dutta Treya, there's only really, as far as I remember, there's only really kind of a Janushi Shasana where you take, you know, you kind of take a kind of, uh, you know, there even one the, kind of the mudra. There's the Maha, yeah, yeah Mahamudra Maha mudra is a kind of Janusha Shasana, isn't it? Where you take the leg back and then you you know you use your seals, but there isn't really any talk of postures for the for the sake no, of, well, of says, a, a particular. Says there's eighty four lakh, so eight point four million. Right, but then they're condensed down. Then out, then it says ultimately there's only one that you need to do, and that's Padmasana. That's the lotus position. Great, great news, great news. <laughs> <laughs> now, nice what about the um? Not. Yeah, yeah. What about the uh, the idea that you know all of a sudden there's been in medieval literature we we've kind of got this break in a tradition which is more ascetic to something which is actually more affirmative in terms of the body, right? Instead of yes. denying the body, we suddenly we see quite almost the reversal that we can supercharge the body now. Um, not to get too David Gordon White about this, but uh, you know we can. We can we can kind of, you know, like do something with the body where, where it's kind of stepped up in a kind of transistor fashion. Yeah, exactly. So that seems to be the big switch that goes on. And that's associated with the arrival of these new practices. Prior to about a thousand years ago, the only physical practices we hear about in the context of yoga are, are these these techniques of mortifying the body, you know, holding mm. arms for years on end. And as you said, to kind of deny or subdue or mortify the body. And then mm. there's this change in approach where the body is something to be used, to be cultivated and can in itself, if it's manipulated internally correctly, bring about certain mystical states. And so why why does that appear? I mean, I, there's definitely something going on through relation with, with China, okay? And Tibet mm. maybe, but I think possibly these practices come from China and then go from India and Tibet. Mm. And then, they're going to be circulating around quite a bit. But the, the very first text to teach any of these practices, which is the first sort of major publication out of the Hatha Yoga project, this text called the Amrita Siddhi, um, that was written in a Buddhist milieu in India, in South India, probably 11th century. Um, but it frames the whole yoga process in metaphors of internal alchemy. Okay, and it took me ages, and me and my um, co co-editor Peter Santo took us ages to to recognize this and that was kind of the far, the last sort of uh, piece of the puzzle when we can fully mm. make sense of the text after that but this is this is again an innovation in India but it's preceded we see very similar practices and also well not practices not so much but the the understanding of the body and these alchemical metaphors to describe the body are current in China two or 300 years before the production of this text. And there are other things like um, certain elements of tantric practice uh, and also external alchemy, you know, using, creating mercury mm -hmm. and using that in various different ways to assimilate it with other substances and so forth. Yeah. They too appear in India around this period, but um, uh, 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 there's plenty of evidence for them quite a lot earlier in China. And indeed, some of the some of the material substances that you need to do alchemy aren't found in India. You know, yes, yeah, they only come from China. Produced, yeah, yeah. only come from China. Um, and I think actually there's a whole broader world that there's this whole world of exchange could 
really do with more investigation. I think also cannabis, the use of cannabis, which again is associated with these alchemical traditions. People have generally assumed, I mean, it's been, it's been recognized for a while now that despite what people might say about, you know, the mentions of Bhang in the Vedas, meaning that cannabis was used in India three or 4,000 years ago, mm. there's no, that, that doesn't stand up to scrutiny at all. And the first time, so cannabis is not mentioned, for example, in Charaka and uh, Sushruta, the earliest Ayurvedic texts. It only first appears in Indian medical treatises and in religious texts, or again, around a thousand years ago, this same period. And we know that it was being used in China. So people, the kind of current consensus is that it probably arrived with in India with um, with Sufi wandering Sufi saints and so forth. Mm, mm. But I think there's potential for exploring the you know the Eastern angle as well. I think there's a huge exchange going on there. Um, but what I, at the same time, we, we don't have any kind of what anyone you know a kind of contemporary on the Chinese side doing the kind of work you're doing and you could kind of meet up in the middle, right? And say, yeah, there, well, are, there, are. there yeah. are, okay, right. Because I know, I mean, like, I, I should remember the first time going back to the older uh, Redroli, you know, the first time I ever um, heard of this possibility that you to preserve semen was actually in that um, Yong Chang Wild Swans, that famous uh, book many years ago. And she talked of her grandfather, her father, uh, always preserving his vital fluid, you know, so I mean, this is a yeah in that popular book right it was struck me at the time you know so i mean obviously these practices you know have a vital kind of root together somewhere along mm. the line yeah that, that does seem to be a very old notion in in the chinese traditions although i'm not sure whether they that they actually describe a, a practice similar to vajroli then the, the idea the concept of of preserving the the the, the sort of male um energy seminal energy is, mm. is there I'm not sure about the techniques, but yeah, there is, there's lot, lots of ground, lots of uh, you know possibilities for future collaborative research. There's a there's a scholar called Dolly Yang who we had a so Mark and Daniela as part of the Hatha Yoga Project um, organized a conference bringing people in of sort of peripheral traditions to yoga, trying to see if they influence the the development of physical yoga practice. So we're looking at you know, wrestling and dancing and these Chinese mm. and so forth. And most of these things drew a blank, actually, I'm afraid. I know lots of people want to see that dancing is part of the yoga's history, but there seemed to be no clear crossover. But this uh, Dolly Yang, who didn't come in person, I don't think, uh, but she she sent in a paper and she's published stuff since, which, which looks at these early parallels, these kind of first millennium forerunners of things that then appear in, in the yoga traditions. And that... The parallels are very strong. The connections are, are, are clearly very strong. But that said, there are, there are, met, and, and also actually inversions are there as well, quite early on in the Chinese side of things. So, oh. um, hmm. uh, but the, there are plenty of practices that appear within the yoga tradition about a thousand years ago that we don't find in China as well. And plenty right. of the asanas, Ketri Mudra, I don't think there's a precedent for right. that the practice. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying it all came from China then, but certainly there was a strong influence from China. No, in you know, it does seem to be this this shift of, like you say, from denying the body to subdu from subduing the body to cultivating it, and the body being used as a, a tool to be looked after, to be improved, and mm. then used and manipulated. It seems, seems rather abrupt, almost, to not have some kind of interpolation from outside or on a, on a tradition that seemed rather more. more homogenous up to that point and then suddenly it's rather different isn't it i mean yeah. along those lines what you know is there any precedent i mean i know we've gone through this a hundred times but is there any precedent to, for, for modern yoga related to the tantric yoga which we find there i mean it, you know they seem to be aiming at different things really i mean the postures at that point aren't significant in themselves they certainly are ends in themselves um and then at a certain point i believe in the pradipika the postures have that develop their own kind of energetic significance. Is that right? And so, I mean, that's the way that I, I expect people would generally frame a practice today, unless they're going to say that they're simply doing it for health reasons. They would say, well, you know, the postures have an energetic significance on the body and thus doing the postures, so that they tune or purify one's own energy. Um, so they do have tantric roots. This would perhaps be the, the most feasible way through I could see. 
Yeah, the, I mean, the postures themselves, when they're classified as asanas in the text, oh. they are almost, oh. I think, without exception, really, they're kind of preliminary to the higher right. practices. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's said, for example, fairly early on, my old asana, the peacock pose, because it's brings about, you know, because it's, because you're emulating a peacock, it burns up uh, poisons that you might have eaten, that kind of thing. So you get a few mentions of stuff like that, uh, but no real kind of, um, what we say, soteriological kind of um, yeah. Effect. Yeah, like resulting in some kind of higher liberated state. But that, uh, if you're looking for physical techniques, it's the mudras really. That, and some of which are are really quite like asanas. You know, the, the invert whatever vipreet the karani when you turn the body upside down, or yeah. this uh, maha mudra that we talked about earlier, which is similar to, to to things that are also taught as asanas. But really. Yeah, asanas generally, and, and it, I'd say it's the same within the sadhu tradition. Well, there's a, again, there's this this kind of slight confusion of uh, sometimes asanas are understood also as methods of tapas. You know, if you hold some really mm. painful, difficult posture for hours on end, that's more, it's that, so there's this crossover between the two, the two notions. You know, they, I think they were separate, but now they've been kind of, you know, entangled for a thousand years. So that, that's mm. slightly but generally, Sadhu, so my guru, for example, uh, he, when when he was a young man, you know, he was a sort of teenager when he was first learning yoga, he he did it very kind of, you know, spent a lot of time on it for, for a few years, four or five years. But then after that, he would only do an asana, asana session if he was kind of feeling out of sorts or stiff or felt that, you know, to be, I'm, to be honest, I'm I'm the same. If I'm doing too much work and I've I've been sitting at my desk too long, that's the sort of time I will be more more regular about doing asana practice. <laughs> it make me feel better. Yeah. If, we, if we've been at a kumbha mela for a couple of weeks with my guru sitting around doing not very much, he'd be like, oh, God, we need. We then go off to an ashram somewhere. It's like doing a going to the gym, isn't it? Like, oh, yeah, we really need to start a bit of moving here. You know, we've yeah, been reset. eating way too much. I mean, yeah, I'm not too much tali, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah, smoking so was, too much bang. Yeah. Just really clean up our clean up our act here a bit. Yeah. And that's a good question though, Jim, you raise. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the kind of structure of a conference which is um still not um, precipitated yet for me, but uh, which was the, the relationship between say, you know, your scholarly work and uh, you know, work in the field, you know. I mean, I know that you spent as I said at the start a lot of time in the field with with sadhus um and you know, you've had a yoga practice for a long time. What do you see as the relationship between the two? I mean, I know you've also tried, you got into this whole thing but because of the tongue practice of Kachari Mudra, right? And you wrote a lot of papers on this and, and learned to do it. I remember we, we spoke to that uh, on the last podcast. You actually managed to do this mudra, which is for people that don't know the, the uh, cutting of the frame or, or not. But anyway, the tongue is able to go back and, and uh, seal the back or touch the back of the soft palate or something like that. Go up the, the, the soft palate, the soft cap, yeah. Forward, well, you'll yeah. know about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, do you see any relationship between the two things? I mean, you know, I mean, I know you were first and foremost a kind of practitioner, weren't you? And then, or, or, or were you? What well, do the, you see yourself as? <laughs> the two have, well, now, the last year, I haven't been to India for t two or three years. Now. I'm going going next month, well, in a couple of months, but because um, obviously because of the pandemic. So at hmm. the moment I see myself rather, rather as, a, as a scholar. But... Hmm. Um, yeah, for me, it was, so the reason I, I did started my work on Ketri Mudra in particular was because I wanted, this is, that was, I started my PhD in 1995 and I wanted to find a text to edit from manuscripts that was relevant to the world that I was living in when I was in India. Mm -hmm. And the only mm -hmm. Sanskrit texts that were relevant to it were the ones on on yoga on physical yoga, which I didn't really realize the significance of at the time. But I think that that is significant because almost all the rest of their practices are passed down orally. Okay, um, right. But you weren't privy to those. Right? The, the, the ones that you saw were, were the physical ones, and then I suppose yeah. Um, but the well, I mean, for example, the so the, the tradition I lived in is combines the two things I was talking about, the, the, the sort of body positive, up to physical yoga, and also the body mortification, you know, standing right. up, 
And then, yeah. So within that tradition, the, the the practices of tapas are not written down at all. They are all only passed on orally. Okay. For, you know, there's no there's no Sanskrit text telling you how to stand up for twelve years on end or how to hold it, hold your arms. Yeah. Is, it, is there much instruction around that? Or, well, sure. You know? Yeah. Because it goes down through lineages. Absolutely. And generally. Oh, really? a, a, Guru, you know, right. someone who someone who's stood up for twelve years, what one of their disciples we'll pass that on. So they right. were, you know, presumably there's quite a lot of uh, stuff that goes well, with that. I haven't really. Yeah, explored. well, don't pick me. Don't, yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. pick. Yeah, exactly. Pick him. Pick him. He he looks like he's got better legs. Yeah, I just <laughs> I just a not sadhu that I know from Kutch in Gujarat, and I'm in touch with one of his disciples, and he for twelve years has every Navratra, so it's coming up in about a month, he sits down for nine days, doesn't move, doesn't eat, doesn't drink, doesn't move, mm. talk, he sits there. And so I wrote to find out if he's doing it again this year. And he said, no, his disciple is starting this year. So he right. will have trained someone up. So, and again, there's no, there's no Sanskrit text telling you how to sit down and not move for nine days on end. That will be purely what he would have learned from his guru and then passing on his experience. Mm. Um, mm. But but the one exception to that is these um, these yoga methods because I think they for some reason they sort of went they've gone more broadly beyond the Saudi world. Okay. Uh, anyway, so there's a long long winded answer. So I looked around for a text that um, <clears throat> on that, that yeah that was relevant to the world I was living in, and I set mm. on this, this Ketri Vidya text all about Ketri Mudra. <clears throat> um, and that, so throughout, so you asked about, you know, the two different, two different lives in a way, but the two are always yeah. one another. So there's, yeah, there's no way I would have maintained the, the scholarly uh, life without the, the, the practical lived experience. And um, to right. a great extent, the scholarly life is trying to make sense of the world in India and they're trying to understand more about it. Um, mm. You know, I, I never thought I'd be a historian, but, but obviously to, to, understand the present you need to know what's gone before and it's such a sort of tangled web tangled mess of different influences over the yeah. over the millennia that that's what i've been trying to untangle so that yeah i needed the needed the um the lived experience to sustain me through the scholarly world but vice versa as well sometimes you know living the sadhu life it can be quite boring as well you know it's occasionally stuck at my Guru's ashram somewhere in deepest Maharashtra. I do, oh, I do remember, you know, a couple of weeks being really not a lot going on. And oh, yeah. And so yeah. You know, a bit of yoga and meditation. Yes. And there's, you know, smartphones. I've probably run out of books by then. So it's just sort of taking notes and trying to make sense of, and you know. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, you don't see the ability to just sit and be. You know, I, I can remember seeing that first in, in India. And you just kind of think, how do they do it? You know, like, you're just kind of sitting, getting on antsy. It's like, I've got to do something here, you know. Like, very good at sitting around doing absolutely yeah, nothing. So, yeah. So again, that so, right. so kind of observing and trying to make sense of the world whilst I'm there too. So the two things kind of feed off. I, you know, I don't think I'd have sustained the life in India without the scholarship and all the scholarship. Yeah, yeah. And I expect they never really presented. I mean, when they gave you any instruction, they probably didn't give any background or context. It's just like, well, this is what we do, and this is how you know, the, the, perhaps the challenge or the obstacle to towards achieving that, and therefore, you know. I, I imagine mm -hmm. it's not, you know, there wasn't a, I mean, usually I think in, in sadly worlds that I understood from Daniela, they, there's a little bit of scorn for textual uh, information in a way that, you know, it's seen as yeah. experiential, right? And if you go into a text, then, you know, like, well, you haven't, you know, yeah. you know, you're never going to know if you don't know in your own body kind of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, that said, so my sure. guru, my guru first, you know, he was, when he was, as I said, he was a young man, he was probably 15 or something when he started doing his, uh, doing his yoga practice and he was living yeah. in, in Varanasi for a lot of that and he would go to all the bookshops and buy buy the, oh, really? right. little books right. on, you know, the old Sanskrit texts and read mm. them I think mm. because you know he was interested that's what he was doing he was, he mm. was mm. everything available but yeah sure ultimately his experience was through um through practice yeah mm. Mm. um I was going to say, I was actually, I was going to kind of, it came up to my mind just now. You know, I think I'm a complete non sequitur, really, but you know, I think about Madhyavasi, Madhyavas, Swami Madhyavasi, that um, should have probably asked you this off, off, uh, off air, really. And he was the guru, an interesting kind of figure of Hatha Yoga, the, uh, 
influenced uh, Sri Yagendra and uh, Kavalyananda of the Kavalyadam Institute. He's got a very um, kind of tantric. Madhav Das. Madhav Das. Yeah, Ma yeah, Madhav Das. Yeah. Don't know much about him, although I think he's. I, uh, I haven't looked into it for a while, but I think he's of the same lineage as me, though, Ramanandi. Oh, really? Right. Yeah, there's nothing really about him. So if you do find anything, let me know. Um, okay. But that was, a, you know, a sidebar. I had a question in my mind, which is this, I remember it now. Um, Daniela also mentioned you have to, people have to listen to this podcast with Daniela, if you haven't already. But Daniela Bevelaxa, I uh, mentioned that she didn't want to get initiated. In the, she lived with salaries like Jim. She didn't want the initiation because she didn't want to have knowledge that was given to her the way she, that she couldn't share in an academic sense now. You know, for, you have been initiated, I think, much to the chagrin of your own wife, who um, was not certain about the process. I mean, did the um, did it change anything? Did were you privy? I mean, I'm obviously not going to pry here, but were you privy to information and, and teaching that you weren't to previously? Did it? Well, hmm. yeah, you, I think you. So the what you're talking about the that my wife wasn't so so sure about that was being made a mahant so that's like a sort of yes the mahant right well, that's know, a, with a like, high kind of um yeah yeah that's yeah. kind of being like a boss raised to a higher level yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 but the yeah. initial yeah. initiation was years ago it was 1992 and claudia my wife was initiated at the same time oh right that's okay sorry yeah 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 it was the mahant thing, then, yeah yeah there was i mean Babaji was always pretty open with me about stuff. Not, you know, things were, he would tell me stuff that he wouldn't tell other people, but he would never say, you can't tell, say this to, a, to, to anyone else. There were a couple of times. So there was one time, you know, then there were different initiations into different things. So I never had the full, right. full sadhu initiation, but I got a few different initiations along the way, such as, uh, I, in the 90s did a lot of going on pilgrimage around india so i'd seen all 11 all 11 out of the 12 jyotir lingas which are these uh, temples to shiva you know from kedar and Hart up in the himalaya down to rameshwaram down in the far south and there's only one remaining which was um uh kashi vishwanath so in varanasi and that was always a bit, that was always going to be a bit tricky because they, and I think they're a bit more relaxed about it now. I haven't, well, I haven't been for a few years, but it sort of would change uh, uh, over the years. But at that time, they were very uh, strict about not letting foreigners in. Right. Okay. So we, I was with Babaji and I, you know, what, what are we going to do about this? He said, okay, look, I know what we'll do. I'm going to give you the ash initiation. Okay. So that you can, you're allowed to cover yourself in ash. And we were on the on the opposite bank of the Ganga on the sand there, and we burnt lots of cow dung stuff. And and then he did give me a, it was a particular initiation with a special mantra and so forth. So that in some ways was a yeah a higher or a you know a, a kind of gate kept practice where I had to have that initiation in order to know the mantra and to be allowed to apply the ashes. So I then I was just in a loincloth right. covering myself in ashes. Right. We put a boat back across the river went into the temple and it all went very well. I, you know, I felt very, oh, I can't I see a picture of that. Feeling, but it, wasn't, it wasn't just like a disguise. Huh? Yeah, exactly. It was basically, yeah, yeah, basically yeah. Disguise. Actually, just a disguise. disguise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a, a white body that was standing out, but by covering myself in ashes, that wasn't apparent anymore. But I was feeling very, I, mean, I always remember I was feeling very pleased with myself and I've done it, you know, got the, had the darshan of the, of, uh, of Kashi Vishwanath and then, was walking back through one of the alleys outside the temple afterwards and some guy some shopkeeper sort of lent out and went hello you want biz lady <laughs> <laughs> so he recognized me as a foreigner i was like oh it's obviously not <laughs> yeah. Trying oh, to sell me yeah yeah yeah, yeah biz lady. i was thinking where do i know that word Bob? yeah the minerals isn't it yeah oh god that must have just yeah, yeah. broken your call seriously yeah uh, yeah yeah range your brain yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I suppose, what are you working on next then? Where are you, where, where do you, where are you look, where are you looking at? I mean, um, you know, the as I said, the, projects, start... the new project. So we got the right. Hub project. We just had a session on that this morning, actually. Um, I'm just wrapping that one up because that was, that was meant to be finished. Wasn't it? You're a bit tardy on that. No, no, that's the hut. So this is quite confusing. Okay, it's right. There's the hut yoga project, which was the really big <laughs> five year one. Yeah, yeah, uh, with with Jason and Daniela and Mark. Yeah, yeah, and still got plenty of outputs of that. You know, they're all about ninety percent done, and it's that last ten percent. There's always a bit of a 
nightmare. Um, but then we got two new projects, both with Jason as well. So there's the Hub to Pradeepika project, which is a joint UK German uh, project. So we've got, we're working with three scholars in Germany, um, Jürgen Hernandez, the prof in charge there. And so that's to produce a critical edition of the Hatha Pradeepika, which hasn't been done. And one of the reasons it hasn't mm. been done is so many manuscripts. So we've so far kind of looked at 170 or 180. Oh, wow. So trying to make sense of that is, and right. luckily we've got one, um, well, two, two on the German team. We've got Mitsuo Demoto, the Japanese lady who lives in Germany, and she's doing amazing work, working out the different groupings and how the manuscripts relate to each other. And then with the help of uh, Nils Jakob Liersch, who's the other um, postdoc, well, the doc doctoral candidate who's working on the project, and he, you know, he's really good on all the computer stuff and putting in all the different readings, and the computers can help mm. look at the relations between the manuscripts. And are, are the discrepancies so great? And 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 why do they matter? Right, well, right, okay. So sometimes it's in the individual reading. I mean, just today we were looking at this this reading, which could be seen as quite controversial because. <clears throat> It's talking about which, uh, what foods you should and shouldn't eat as a yogi. And there's this phrase, Interesting. Uh, Ajadi or Ajavi Mansam, or Ajadi is unmetrical. Anyway, we spent a lot, a lot of time looking at that this morning. But it, it, it's saying that you shouldn't eat uh, meat such as that of goat, or maybe, and then the, we're not sure about the reading. It could also be, but I think it's more like just you shouldn't eat goat meat etc but it could be you shouldn't eat the meat of goats and sheep but what the question is why does it not just say you shouldn't eat meat yeah, For stop, yeah. it seems to be specifying certain and why the yeah. kinds of usually, meat rather than usually blank, pork yeah. isn't it it's strange yeah but i mean yeah well that's good well, it's slightly controversial isn't it I mean, yeah. we're not quite sure well, what what the implication is and then even looking at the 19th century commentary by brahmananda he again just says, "Yeah, it's saying you shouldn't eat meat of the of the of the class that's derived from goats." So it kind of seems to be leaving a window for eating for eating some sorts of meat. Right. So there's those well, very small a, differences. That, that matters for people that care for Sunday lunch, doesn't it? It matters <laughs> a great, matters a great deal. Yeah. If you, can, if you can't eat sheep, or you eat I mean, lamb, I, is it? Uh, yeah. Why don't? Because nowhere when it's telling you what you should eat does it say you should eat meat. So it just seems quite odd, you know. That, so we're trying mm, to make sense of mm, little mm. tiny things like that, but then also mm. bigger things about the structure. Again, right. you know, Vajroli is a big thing in this because some texts <laughs> leave it out altogether. Some some put it in an appendix saying, you know, this is only for the higher level students. You know, some leave it where it was originally probably, or and others introduce longer sections on kechari and so forth. So um, yeah. I mean, that's what it's saying. Actually, and it's, it's, it's hard to, because the other problem we have is that as the manuscripts have been copied and transmitted over mm. the centuries, quite often the people ascribe will be looking at more than one and comparing readings. And then, so we can't actually, we can't be certain of what the original was, but we, you know, there are, we have to just use our more our language skills in, in, in fact, than, than because in theory, when you've got a whole bunch of manuscripts, you you could almost mechanically reconstruct what the what the original text was if they didn't right. copy each other down the line, but they do. So yeah. it's just it's all a bit chaotic. But yeah, we're we're getting there. We're making progress. And of course, nowadays we can present. We we will present a book of the edition, but you can also do it all online. So it makes it easier to produce different versions of of the text. So, for example, the fourth chapter is this huge amount of variation between all the different manuscripts there. You know, some of them are much longer than others and they have different passages. So we'll be able to represent them all. Um, and I mean, is it, is it going to be online free, just like the, how the yoga project was that you put out and one of the, the stipulations of that grant was that you had to put out all the information free, right? Uh, yes. How about this? Yeah, yeah. Do, you yeah, get, all, do we get it free? Okay. It's all going to be free again. If you can make head or tail of it, then um, the, book, you know. the book's yeah. going to be free, obviously yeah. the actual <laughs> books themselves but the yeah, information yeah, yeah. from the books will be available for free online yeah fantastic i mean I, I, we were talking before and i rather kind of i recognize rather rudely um you know kind of uh, uh, was wondering about the discrepancy between these small details that you're you know that you and jason have meticulously analyzed and and 
and how they make a difference um, you know, to the, to the general dissemination of, of the work. Um, so how do they, getting the small details right, does it really, does it implicate what we're currently doing? Does it have a, you know, a kind of knock, a trickle down effect in, do you think in the yoga world generally? Um, how do you see that things might be clarified more in the text that would make a difference to the popular kind of dissemination and understanding of yoga? Well, I mean, there are things, so for example, what I was talking about with the Dattatra Yoga Shastra earlier mm. about whether, um, you know, whether, whether it's instructing you to do Ashtanga yoga or Hatha yoga, or whether you should do both. In fact, that to a certain extent rests on different variants between the manuscripts, you know, so whether, right. basically whether it's a, a, an and or an or, you know, trying to work out and then by establishing the relationship between yeah, the manuscripts. That's crazy. Can, yeah. Can the first. So that is yeah. quite a big deal, I guess, you know, yeah. what, what instruction is there. I'm not, not yeah. saying that text is, is, you know, that is how everyone should practice yoga. But if we want to know what the, what the early teachers were saying, then we need to, need to explore which is, these yeah things. which is why you kind of famously i think many people have kind of questioned it why you call yourself a philologist a study of language because really it does come down to understanding i think you know, kind of cl clauses in, in grammar etc right and all that stuff around language yeah, that's it's not just that i mean to, right. as as my uh, my supervisor my 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 tutor in oxford for my phd alexis sanson was, was mm. written about this a lot but it's not just the, the language as well. You need to immerse yourself in the whole culture. You need, you know, it's impossible, of course, to do it properly, but you kind of have to transport yourself back to that period in order to understand absolutely everything about a text. And today, again, going back to what we were looking at this morning, we were looking at all the, the, the prohibitions about the different types of food, and there are some quite obscure terms, you know, trying to understand what these foods are. That's not, that's, that's moving beyond just simple grammar and, and language, you know, you need to, and, and in fact, when we were reading the text, we had this workshop in France and uh, Professor Duwakar Acharya now in Oxford, he was there and he, you know, he was able to explain, there was one reference to one of the things you shouldn't eat, which are these sesame cakes. And then you know, we didn't really understand what it was, but basically when you grind sesame seeds to get rid of the oil, you're then left with the husks of the sesame seeds. Right, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, people will then kind of squash them together and yes. fry them. I'm not sure. I can't remember what he said. Uh, and eat them, but the kind of poor, poor people because these are like yeah, husks, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like animal food, really. Isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you, so, well, you, so the, anyway, the Hatha Pradipika says you shouldn't eat, shouldn't eat them. You know, so. They'd have a heyday these days, wouldn't it? No, you know, can you imagine around these days? You know, like with McDonald's, etc. You know. <laughs> If that's the worst, if that's the worst on the table, you know, eating a dried uh, husk of sesame, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you can only imagine the kind of tomes that would come out now, you know, injunctions against what you, what you should and shouldn't eat. Um, yeah, well, I suppose we probably won't go any more into Bajaroli Mudra, but I mean, it's, uh, uh, to wrap it up, maybe to kind of sandwich the interview and, and start where we, 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 uh, we finished last time, Jim, um, I think you more recently said that you know, in, in a paper that Bajaroli wasn't actually an possible at all without it without the aid of the pipe anyway and i was going to clarify this point that it was you know is that is that how you've come to understand it that is that i would still i would still stand by that argument i know there are some people and in fact uh, there's a practitioners associated with, with the tibetan tradition who i'm in correspondence with at the moment i need to reply to about this but uh yes because the in order to do it, you know, there's a, there's a sphincter, there's a valve within mm, your mm. that needs to be held open by sticking the yeah. pipe up. Yeah. Because, uh, otherwise it's, you know, it's only, it's a, it's a one, one way valve. Things can only go, go down it. Um, and if you, I mean, I, I suppose people might argue that you could, could have control over this sphincter, but doctors say that's anatomically impossible. And if it was permanently open, then you'd be incontinent because you wouldn't be able to stop yeah, urine right. coming up and so forth. So that's kind of key to my argument there. And the texts always say it needs to be. Even my guru, though, even within the tradition, he would say that, oh, you know, there are some great yogis in Gorakhpur or whatever who, you know, he, 
he, he reckoned may, may be able to do it. He never actually verified this, but he just kind of, you know, there's a there's sort of legend that people can do it without the pipe, but I don't see that that's feasible. And hence, well, hence the, the notion of being able to do it during sexual yes. becomes un, unviable. Yeah. Had to touch on it a little bit more. Um, I couldn't resist. Well, I mean, to, that's, yeah, I yeah, I, that's all about our women doing it, which is quite interesting. Oh, really? Yeah. The women, yeah. Right, I thought there weren't any mention of women now being taught the tapio. No, no, well, this is the one exception. Interesting. Right. Seriously. And it's, so it, it says women can do it. it. It goes into a bit of detail about how it's done. Uh, in, and it, there's a, I mean, God, in, the, in the, the, the current sort of these days is, is all quite problematic. Although I think it's it's rather wonderful that it it's and surprising that it even addresses the fact that women can and should do it and how they do it. It does say uh, it does say that they should only practice you know with a with with a decent a, a good upstanding man, and it, it has to be someone who knows this yoga text. So right. that's interesting because <laughs> yeah. I think I think I heard you speaking last, and, and when someone I think mentioned that, that that there may have been a, a tradition of women had the yogi practitioners that you you know kind of said that that probably wasn't the case but you, you know now you you know you're thinking that there, there were well yeah but then you have to sort of differentiate between different strands of practice these mudra these more sort of esoteric techniques related to sexual ritual yeah i think there's certainly evidence of that and there's you know there's great there's some there's a rather wonderful Marathi legend from the 13th century. So probably a similar time and maybe similar area to where this text was written, the Dathatra Yoga Shastra. And it's about these, this male and female yogi and yogini having a kind of sexual battle and she wins. She manages to suck all his energy. Yeah, yeah. Shrivel him up. Exactly. Of course <laughs> she does. But so there's that kind of stuff. But what we don't have evidence for is women doing asana practice. Really, we, I mean, I'm not saying it means it didn't happen, but we have no, to my knowledge, no textual or art historical or even legendary, you know, even sort of folk tales or whatever legends of 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 women doing asana practice. Just to wrap it up, where do you think your academia is going in the future with yoga studies? Can you see any, I mean, we talked about the Chinese Avenue going into more kind of um, relational. Um, yeah, I mean, a big. Outside of India. Funny yeah. enough, I'm about to write a, a glowing reference for a project application from Germany, or actually for a Belgian, Belgian based project to edit the uh, Patanjali, Patanjali Yoga Shastra. It's not been done. I mean, it's crazy. Wow. So Philip Mars has done the first chapter, the first, the Samadhi Pada. I think that nearly yeah. killed him. I think that was enough for him, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, no, yeah, he's, keen, he's keen, he's keen. Is to he keen? To, is he keen? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So Jam, that's a Jam. big, that's a big yeah. gap. You know, not having a really yeah. solid critical edition of Patanjali. It's not there. Um, so hopefully that will come together. Um, what else? Yeah, the China, the, the, the sort of broader connections would be good. And also vernacular texts. Um, I think that's that's so, so particularly from the central and southern India, there's lots of interesting yoga texts in Marathi. There must be and thousands Canada. of these vernacular texts. Yeah, um, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's some a, quite yeah. early, early mm -hmm. material. So that's a, mm. that's a really exciting avenue. I have ar arguments with Jason about this. I'm reasonably convinced that in terms of the the early Sanskrit texts on Hatha Yoga, I think we've got pretty much all of them. I don't hmm. there may be one or two that have that we've lost, but we've definitely seemed to have the bulk of them. It's not like they're a huge yeah, can you be so clear? Well, because so for example, with the Hatha Pradipika being a compilation, yeah. right, um, okay. you can identify hmm. nearly all the passages. Mm, mm, you know, there's okay. a couple of gaps. Yeah. There's a there's a bit he could have missed some. Couldn't he? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, but yeah. he missed them and there's no evidence for them now. I think we'll never find them. You know, they're not going to be in, you know, True enough, yeah. loads of manuscripts, yeah. catalogs yeah. and stuff. So we, we don't, um, uh, think we, we don't, uh, you know, we don't see in those, in those manuscript catalogs places where, um, you know, the tech, tech references to text that, that might be. Yeah, possible. you don't, right. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Jason's often of the opinion that, um, you know, he he likes to think there are more texts out there. 
you know, something will come up. It's like a Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'll find, yeah, you know, yeah. find it in a dusty archive, and then yeah. it'll fall, I mean, they, fall to, yeah, piece, fall to pieces text, to my hands. Yeah, it could be totally separate from. In fact, I mean, there is one text from probably Kashmir Punjab called the Amaraga Shasana, um, <laughs> which is on Hatha Yoga and is completely distinct, really, from the rest of the, right. of the corpus that mm. we have. So there might be texts like that around around the place, but within this kind of self-referential world um, mm, mm. text that, that we've been looking at. There don't seem to be huge gaps in the Sanskrit traditions, but I, I think that the, um, the, the, yeah, these vernacular texts are likely to be really fruitful and really influential, I think. And another, actually, also one other, uh, one, and it was vernacular. I mean, vernacular sounds slightly derogatory, doesn't it? But kind of non-Sanskrit text. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Going yeah. to a yeah. workshop in, yeah. in Italy next month uh, which is part of it. It's looking at Tamil texts, not just on yoga. I've, I've been in, asked a long, I don't read Tamil, but they're going to be looking at it. Turumantiram, which is probably 11th or 12th century, yeah, late 11th century, I think we can date it at. And that has some really fascinating, obviously early teachings on, on physical yoga practice, including asanas and so forth, and lots of right. interesting contextual, contextual stuff. So that, I think, again, is a, because you know, it's a, you know, we have a problem. You know, lots of lots of great Tamil specialists, but no Tamil specialists working on yoga. Right. So that's why I've been wrong to try to I make to, sense of I'll what. Invite what you back for a, for an, for another round, then. You know, After you know, that, yeah, you know, report back yeah. from the Tamil. Yes, yeah, so you're going to have yeah yeah Tamil now. You have to learn Tamil yeah. and report back to us. Um, well, that sounds fascinating, and um and yeah, it really does. Uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, I really appreciate you chatting to you again. Um. It's been a great chat and, you know, not so much about Fajroli and uh, <laughs> a little bit. Um, and, yeah, uh, we'll look forward to the third instalment, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, where are we next year sometime, maybe? All right. Great. I'd love to. Thanks, Adam. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Good chatting.